Welcome back Guardians. Today we are continuing with our exotic weapon lore series. In part 1 we covered all exotic primary weapons that have an ornament. In this video we will cover all special weapons that have an ornament. I will give a brief lore description of the weapon first and then describe how the weapon ornament has significance. Be aware, sometimes the weapon ornaments are intricately linked to the story of the weapon and other times the significance is much less obvious. If you are watching this video between 6 and 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time US, it is likely that I am over on Twitch preparing for the Age of Triumph and the return of the old raids. Feel free to come join me over on Twitch. This is Mullen Games and I hope you enjoy this latest Destiny lore episode. Starting from the top left of the special weapons and working our way across, Telesto. This is one of my favourite exotic weapons. The ornaments and the Grimmel card give the impression that the Telesto contains the remnants of the Queen's Harbingers. The Harbingers are those blue orbs that the Queen and her Tachyans summon in the opening scene of the Taken King. The Harbingers are not necessarily only weapons, but the Queen uses them as weapons. They are described as being alive, and apart from being used when the Awoken tried to take on Oryx, they were also used during the Reef Wars. The Queen used the Harbingers to destroy the House of Wolves fleet, and later would create an illusion of the Harbingers to gain a tactical advantage during the Reef Wars. During the Reef Wars, it appears that the Harbingers were used for purely destructive purposes, However, when the Awoken took on Oryx, there appears to be a hidden agenda of using the Harbingers, and that was to implant them on the Dreadnought. What exactly this means is still unknown, however it is told to us that this is the plan in the Coven Grimmel card. Regardless, following the battle between the Awoken and Oryx, the Telesto Grimmel card reveals that remnants of the Harbingers are lingering around Saturn's moons. The card reads, Vestiges of the Queen's Harbingers yet linger among Saturn's moons. Expanded search of Saturn's nearby moons produced only one notable discovery. A cloud of Harbinger matter collected around Saturn's 13th moon, designation Telesto. A sample is enclosed for your examination. The word vestige means trace or remnant of something that is disappearing or no longer exists. So the card implies that they have captured a sample of the remnant harbingers used during the battle. The most densely populated area of this matter was around the 13th moon of Saturn named Telesto. So the fact that this weapon is named Telesto strongly indicates that this weapon is somewhat powered by the remnants of harbinger matter found at Telesto. The ornaments reinforce this theory. The lingering vestige ornament is blue in colour, the same colour as the Harbinger's during the cutscene, and so strongly suggests that Telesta is empowered by Harbinger matter. The other ornament, Queen's Command, I believe is a hint to the overall plan by the Queen. I am sure most of you know that the Queen is not dead, that was revealed during a Bungie livestream, and the haunting words from the Queen the Awoken have played their part, this was all part of the plan, indicates the Awoken loss was intentional or they at least knew they were going to lose. Prince Aldrin also suspects that the Awoken and the Queen knew that they would lose and this was part of the plan. The aftermath of Grimmel card reads, The Techians should have known what the Dreadnought could do, must have known. Did they not feel what he felt? hear what he heard, and that damn catch, it wasn't protected. They had to know that, all to deploy the harbingers. They barely got a foothold before the weapon was fired. So I believe the Queen's command ornament reinforces that the Queen had a plan, and the plan involved the Awoken losing, and the Queen faking her death. Plan C, no ornaments. Queen's break a bow, no ornaments. Chaperone, no ornaments. Invective. Invective actually has some really cool lore that I've overlooked for some time. In Year 1, to obtain Invective, you have to complete the exotic questline, a dubious task. 
This questline explains Cora Ray's more rebellious days, not only being incredibly competent in the Crucible, but also doing what warlogs do best, just wandering the galaxy in the search of truth. The Invective Grimmel card reads, I tried to talk them down. They made a grab for my ghost. After that, it was a short conversation. A Cora Ray. Invective was Akura Ray's weapon of choice during her younger, more rebellious days, an ideal fallback for situations that can't be solved by wit, quick talk, or pure intimidation. This modified shotgun uses self-replicating magazine to keep its owner well stocked for any and all trouble that waits beyond the city. During the exotic quest line, in order to obtain the weapon, you must prove your worth to a core array by collecting a clot of darkness. The quest line reads, A clot of darkness. I ask gardens to prove themselves to me because I don't want to ask too much of them. But you're ready. Find a place where the darkness grows strong. Return with a clot of the darkness itself, gathered from one of the creatures there. Rumour has it that Akura Ray used to roam the system on dangerous solitary expeditions. Perhaps you walk in her footsteps or carry on where she left off. Thank you. I miss the freedom you have, Guardian. Savour it. Listen, I want you to have something of mine, a relic of my wandering days. Following handing in the Clot of Darkness, you must acquire a Golden Age shotgun magazine from the Weaponsmith. This magazine is what grants Invective its self-replicating bullets. And following that, you are actually gifted with a Cora Ray's original Invective shotgun. It is one of the few weapons that is an original and not actually replicated from Golden Age blueprints or prototypes. Upon completing the quest, it reads, Invective, it's yours now. Please don't get yourself killed in some forsaken pit. And if your path permits, bring it back to see me now and then. The two ornaments are Storm's Reproach and Iconoclast. I'm a bit confused by Storm's Reproach. I can't seem to think of the link between the lore with this ornament. When I think about this weapon belonging to a Cora Ray, a warlock, and it uses the word Storm, Storm's Reproach, I instantly think of a Storm Caller. Reproach means to express disapproval or disappointment. Storms reproach, although storms are often associated with storm callers, storms occasionally are likened to the darkness. And considering this questline has us prove our worth by gathering a clot of darkness and facing the darkness, this ornament may just indicate that. Storms reproach, storm being a metaphor for the darkness, reproach being disapproval and disappointment. And so we use this weapon to fight the darkness. A storm's reproach might also just represent a Cora Ray, her abrasiveness and her rebellious days. And that's why it's linked to this weapon. The disapproval and disappointment of the rebellious Cora Ray. The second ornament, Iconoclast, is much more interesting. When equipped, a symbol is added to the weapon frame. This symbol is the same symbol seen on Bad Juju and forms the perk String of Curses. It is also seen on Cora Ray's shoulder pad, it is also on the gyroscope in the speaker's chambers, and it is very similar to the scope of Thorn and Necrochasm, these three intersecting lines. I do not really know what this symbol means, however the word iconoclast means to attack or criticise cherished beliefs or institutions, or destroyer of images used in religious worships. A Cora Ray is also called an iconoclastic guardian. I believe this word iconoclast emphasizes this type of warlock. Warlocks that question everything. They search for the truth. They are not happy with being told history. They want to discover it for themselves. And so I believe iconoclast represents that. These abrasive warlocks willing to attack beliefs and institutions. Which is really interesting because Akora Ray is a vanguard. She sort of has to accept the traveler. However, maybe this ornament more reflects her rebellious days, when she did not accept the traveller, or maybe she did not accept the word of the speaker, this iconoclastic guardian, destroyer of beliefs and institutions, universal remote Zen meteor hereafter, no ornaments. Black Spindle. Remember Black Spindle was originally Black Hammer from Crota's End, it was only a legendary back then, until it was converted to an exotic weapon in the Taken King and could be obtained by completing the alternative ending of the mission Lost Allied. 
The mission Lost Alight is essentially about collecting a shard from Crotus Crystal so we can fill it with Crotus Soul and then enter Oryx's realm whilst pretending to be Ascendant. The alternative ending has us clear a room full of taken enemies and the boss in that room is called Drevix, the Chosen. Unfortunately no lore on Drevix. The mission itself does not give too many clues to the lore of Black Spindle apart from reinforcing Black Spindle is connected to the Hive and the Taken. The Black Spindle card hints at the weapon being related to Oryx's daughters, the Death Singers. It reads, Your only existence shall be that which I weave for you out of sorrow and woe. The followers of Crota swing hammers, sing death songs, fatal final absolute. Ihalak and Iranuk laugh at Crota. Finality is a child's plaything. Fit for one such as Crota, they say. No hammer for the unraveller and the weaver, but a spindle wound with woe, for their foes no end of suffering. So Ihalak and Iranuk are also known as the unraveller and the weaver, respectively. The reason for them being known as the unraveller and the weaver is they stand at the head of Oryx's dreadnought. The Dreadnought is essentially Oryx's throne world. It's more complicated than that, but that will do. And what they do is Irhalak unravels worlds whilst Iranuk weaves them back into Oryx's throne world. Have a listen to both of the Grimmel cards for the Death Singers. The Irhalak card says, She who stands ahead at the prow of the ship of Oryx, her father. She is Irhalak, the Unraveler. She plies her blades upon the fabric of space, cuts the seams, pulls apart the cloth, leaves worlds in tatters. Iranuk. Behind the unraveler comes Iranuk, the weaver. She takes in hand the threads of her sister's work, weaves them into the tapestry of Oryx's realm. So to put all this information together, Black Spindle has a theme of unraveling your enemies, destroying them over and over again, and then weaving them, I guess, into <laughs> the afterlife, uh, weaving them into pain and suffering. You know, as the card reads, your existence shall be that which I weave for you. No hammer for the unraveler and the weaver, but a spindle wound with woe, no end of suffering. I think you could also argue that the mechanics of Black Spindle, returning rounds to the magazine, may even be related to this idea of unraveling and weaving reality. The Black Spindle card definitely seems to be written from the perspective of the Death Singers. So the question is, did the Death Singers make this weapon? We really don't know. And the second question is, is this a weapon of sorrow? Especially since it mentions the word sorrow in its items description. Once again, there's not enough information to indicate that this is a weapon of sorrow. It is possible. However, I don't think there is enough information in the Grimoire cards to really speculate this. Now let's move on to the ornaments, the Cold Between Stars and Ragabone. The Cold Between Stars ornament makes this weapon look like Taken. So I believe the Cold Between Stars is the place where Oryx takes his subjects. He sends them to the Cold Between Stars, where they become Taken. This makes sense in the general theme of the weapon of unraveling and weaving things back together. Oryx essentially breaks his subjects down and rebuilds them into what he believes is the perfect form. The other ornament, Ragabone. I think Ragabone is a slang term for rag and bone man. Rag and bone man is someone who collects unwanted household items and sells them on, scavenging unwanted possessions to sell. I think Ragabone is an ugly, ugly ornament. And yes, it does look like someone just chucked together a whole bunch of unwanted parts to make a snipe rifle. However, the interesting thing about Ragabone is it could imply that this weapon was discarded by the Hive. I have to wonder if the Death Singers discarded this weapon before it came into our possession. Not sure if this is the spot for Icebreaker or Zen Meteor. Uh, unfortunately, I only have the Year 1 Icebreaker, so I'm not too sure where it fits in this blueprint pattern. But regardless, let's cover Icebreaker lore now. There's not a huge amount of lore surrounding the Icebreaker. The Grimoire card explains that it was a collaboration between the Vanguard and a number of weapon foundries. However, only a single weapon reached testing phase, as essentially the weapon would cause fatal damage to the user. I can't see a reason for why its rounds replicate. However, I assume it uses the same golden age technology as the Invective. The most interesting aspect about Icebreaker 
is that only one weapon was completed. However, there are many prototypes, and I believe it is the prototypes that Guardians actually use. Have a listen to the card. Meant as an exploration of Golden Age weapon technology, the project was scrapped after only a single weapon reached the testing phase. The prototypes for the project's lone weapon are considered dangerous and unfit for field duty by the Vanguard. This hasn't stopped daring Guardians from seeking out the icebreakers. Death, after all, is only an occupational hazard. The exciting thing about this is there might be a Grand Master Icebreaker. The only icebreaker to be produced and to make it to testing. And all the other icebreakers are actually just prototypes. The icebreaker ornaments, Dream Maker and Nano Chance, are ornaments that I can't seem to interpret much from. Dream Maker has his camouflage pattern. I'm not really sure how this relates to the icebreaker. Similarly, Nano Chance, I'm not too sure of its significance either. When I think of Nano, I think of Nano Mites, I think of Siva. Alternatively, Nano Chance may be implying a small chance. Likely a small chance this weapon will explode when you try to use it. Moving on, Lord of Wolves. Once again, another exotic I only got during year one. No huge amount of lore either. Uh, the Lord of Wolves Grimoire card mentions a crow named Jolion. Remember that the crows can either be bird-like robotic spies or actually awoken spies. Uh, they are commanded by Master of Crows, Prince Aldrin. However, the control of the crows was then passed on to Varix following the events of the Taken King. The Grimoire card implies that this crow, Jolon, uh, found the weapon, Lord of Wolves, and then modified it to its current iteration. It reads, Jolion was a crow. He'd seen much, more than most. He held the enemy's greatest weapon, remembered its burn, then began tinkering. He liked things, liked how they worked, found happiness in finding new avenues through which a thing could function. Not to alter the purpose, but to simply refine it. Apart from this Grimoire card, the only other lore surrounding Lord of Wolves is from the questline to obtain it, the Elder Cipher Exotic Bounty questline. This quest basically has you find and charge an Elder Cipher in the Prison of Elders. An Elder Cipher is a living tool that the Fallen use to distribute ether, the life source of the Fallen. It is usually in possession of a Kel, and yes, Varix possesses multiple Elder Cyphers now, as we exchange a charged Elder Cipher for a choice of one of the three exotic weapons, one of which included Lord of Wolves. So how does this relate to the new ornament called Perfect Predator? Well, the word perfect has become very synonymous with SIVA, perfected enemies, perfected strikes, etc. As Varix is currently in charge of the Crows, this Crow Jolin found Lord of Wolves, this could imply that Varix or the Crows have been tinkering with the weapon again. But this time, they have used SIVA to perfect it. For those who have seen my Varix video, you will know that I think Varix is a central character to the plotline of the Fallen, and he is in a very powerful position in the storyline, possessing control of the Crows and the Elder Ciphers. So to add Siva into the mix, and controlling Siva to some extent, only adds further fuel to this fire. The Trespasser. This weapon is really cool. Shirofor is an amazing weaponsmith. He's often not given credit for this, however he crafts this weapon. The new Galahorn, Outbreak Prime, and the Kvostov. So Shira knows how to make a weapon. Shira is a scout. He's extremely resourceful, which you can tell by this weapon, the Trespasser. The gun is created from multiple weapon parts. The barrel is different. The magazine looks like it doesn't belong. The receiver is different. However, Shira is not just a resourceful scout that can craft weapons on the fly whilst in the field, but he's also a skilled assassin. The ornament Fallen Assassin implies that Shira has mainly targeted fallen enemies. I believe that his patchwork on his House of Kings cape represents assassinating fallen from the House of Kings. The Crucible Assassin ornament is an interesting ornament. I think it is more about implying that Shira has a high level of skill in the Crucible, rather than Shira actually killing guardians in the Crucible. Remember that Dredgen Yor ruled the Crucible with Thorn at his side, 
and very possible that Dredgenol killed Guardians in the Crucible. But I don't think Shiro did this, even though it says Crucible Assassin. I think the ornament is just saying that Shiro is a beast in PvP and Shiro is a beast in PvE. That concludes this latest Destiny Law episode. I hope you enjoy these uh, lore summaries of all the exotic special weapons which have an ornament. Um, they do take a fair bit of time to put together, so please show your support on the video. And I'll do my best to put up the exotic heavy weapons video very shortly. And then if you really want, I can go back and cover all the other weapons that I've missed, all the other exotics that don't have an ornament. Now, if you'd like to support this channel, please leave the phrase cold between stars. I really like that ornament on the black spindle, and I think it completely appropriate considering the return of Crota's End and King's Fall for Oryx. Cold between stars. As usual, it's been a pleasure. This is Marlin Games. Peace.